Welcome everyone. Um, welcome to our second in a four part series on environmental justice. Um, our uh, wonderful coat committee um, member Jaime is has been organizing these events and he's brought two really great um, guests to speak tonight. Um, just want to begin uh, as usual by thanking our committee sponsors indoor weather professionals, Pilgrim and Hill and Wilkinson. Can't do it without them. And I'm gonna go ahead and pass it off to Jaime. Yeah, so today, you know, we've got two great speakers and I guess to start this discussion, I read a recent article in, you know, the Austin American Statesman, which is titled, it's an opinion piece. It says the EPA needs to save Texas from itself. And I felt that the content of this article and just the headline itself, it highlights the need, well, the state's essential inability to enforce, you know, what few regulations we have to the point where we just have to appeal to the federal government. And, and I think that this also further highlights the need for, you know, grassroots voices uh, to really voice, to really, you know, speak up about what's going on uh, within, you know, our entire state. And, uh, you know, these would be our two speakers here. So uh, I encourage uh, audience members to turn on your cameras if you can to make for a, you know, a little bit more lively interaction. I know we're a little bit zoomed out, but this remote format has allowed us to bring in, you know, speakers from beyond Austin, such as Miguel, who's out, uh, out in El Paso. So I will introduce Miguel now. He, as I mentioned, he's from El Paso. He actually did spend some time here in Austin at St. Edwards, graduated a few years ago. He worked as a legal assistant for uh, environmental attorney David Beck, I think, at the Sierra Club. And he took part in the Sunrise Movement, a youth movement to stop climate change. And he's gonna tell us more about that later. Currently, he's a uh, West Texas field associate with uh, Earthworks and he's been monitoring methane emissions in the Permian Basin. And when I was looking for a speaker, this is one of the things uh, that, that really captured me and that I, I felt like it, it was just uh, very, it's basically like investigating the scene of the crime when the scene of the crime is invisible uh, because he's monitoring essentially these big methane emissions that he's also gonna tell you about. And most recently he was in DC for the People versus Fossil Fuels Week of Action. So with that, I'll stop talking and hand it off to Miguel. Thank you, Jaime. Um, hello, everyone. Um, like Jaime said, my name is Miguel. And yeah, a big focus of what we do is um, visualizing the crime scene. And if you can see my, my Zoom picture here, it's a quick example of that. Um, really quickly, what you see here is a flare at an oil and gas site out in the oil fields. Uh, what you see on my right side is um, what it looks like through the through the naked eye without anything. Um, and what you see here on the left is methane, um, a very dangerous pollutant that is causing the climate crisis. So this is a little bit of what, what we do here at Earthworks. And it all relates to environmental injustice in a lot of ways, which I can talk about here. So let me know if you can see my slides. Yes. My slides good? Okay, awesome. So here's my email, my phone number, if you wanna get in, in contact with me afterwards. Uh, but what I'm gonna focus on today is a case study of how the Permian Basin oil and gas shale, utilities and, um, natural gas myths all hurt communities and sacrifice zones. So I'm gonna focus on four uh, dynamics of environmental injustice that happen all over the country, all over the world, but specifically through the lens of El Paso in the, in, in the last four or five years. First one is that oil and gas production exports climate crisis from Texas to the world. So I'm gonna focus a large portion of this slide, this presentation on production levels 
And I'm going to talk about how that really matters down the line. Secondly, I'm going to talk about how electricity is political. There is no such thing as green, how, as, as um, clean natural gas. And we're going to look, we're going to visualize how that is a myth. Uh, but this is something to keep in mind, you know, as architects, as designers, as folks that work in infrastructure, electricity is definitely political. Thirdly, we're going to talk about um, the state, Texas state government's active promotion of oil and gas. I am not going to cover everything, not even close, but I can talk a little bit about that. And uh, lastly, I'm going to talk about uh, focus on youth and frontline communities as the leaders of climate struggle and why that matters. So firstly, um, oil and gas production. Um, as as uh, my mentor Sharon Wilson says, everything starts with a hole in the ground. And in Texas, that is primarily the Permian Basin, which is out in West Texas and some of South, South New Mexico. Um, the Permian Basin is a nightmare. It is the largest uh, producing oil and gas shale in the United States and in the world. It is a fracking powerhouse that is largely unregulated by the state. It is a massive source of methane. Uh, despite the COVID caused um, drop in production, um, we are now at levels that exceed or are at the same level as during the Trump administration. And this is a relatively recent thing. Um, there was a spike in production around 2015 when there was a boom. So this is what it looks like from, from an aerial view. It's just acres and acres of land that have been used for extraction of oil and gas. You see a map of it right there. So why does it matter? Um, imagine that from this single region, nearly 5 million barrels of oil are being produced and shipped out to the world every single day. And around 19 billion cubic feet of natural gas per day are being exported through pipelines um, to cities around Texas, um, around Louisiana, or expor exported to the world. So we have a big problem here with in Texas with this amount of production. Plus, we have the second highest, um, one of the second highest um, shales in the country as well here in Texas, the Eagle Ford, which produces around 1 million barrels of oil per day and 8 billion cubic feet of natural gas per day. So why does that matter? It, act, it, it affects not only the world, right? Because all of these, all of this process emits methane, but it affects, um, communities directly in the region, one of them being El Paso, uh, where, where Dave and I, our hometown, right? So our nickname is the Sun City. Our mascot is Amigo Man. It's, a, it's an anthropomorphic sun. So you'd think, wow, they really care about solar energy and they use solar energy the best that they can. Well, we don't, not because we don't want to, but because the people in power don't let us. Um, we are the 10th sunniest city in the entire world, as you can see from this graph, um, but we only use 3% renewable energy in our utility. Our utility only uses 3%. The vast majority, as you can see here, comes from natural gas that is sourced from the Permian Basin. So um, this is a clear example of production affecting demand down the line for our community. Um, this is a um, image that I took from the San Antonio Business Journal. This is uh, Marathon Oil uh, proudly displaying how they're using El Paso strategically to help uh, refine some of the gas that's being produced in the Permian. Um, yeah, and, and we're connected through uh, webs of, of pipeline that connect the Permian not only to El Paso, but the rest of the world. Um, and so why does this matter? Why does it matter that we only use uh, 3%? Well, when we use fracked gas, there are people, everyone loses, the entire world, the climate, the general um, air pollution, but specifically those that live close to these gas plants. 
because for natural gas, there needs to be gas plants that pollute emissions that harm people's health. And what do the following uh, communities and barrios here in El Paso have in common? The ones that I listed out here, Chaparral, Montana Vista, Sunland Park, and Azcarate neighborhood. They're all, they're all low income, majority Spanish speaking, immigration, mixed status homes. Some folks might be undocumented in the family. And this is where polluters have chosen to locate their fossil fuel infrastructure. So I'm gonna go way back to the first slide of uh, the Permian. This is what happens when we produce oil and gas. Down the line, people suffer. Not everyone suffers the same. Um, people that are already marginalized suffer disproportionately. If you wanna learn more about the Permian and how it affects um, downstream and other um, communities in Texas and Louisiana, I highly recommend uh, this website. Um, so if you wanna check that out. So another context that I want to look at through the lens of El Paso is electricity. Electricity is not political. Uh, and there's no such thing as clean natural gas. Let me show you why. I'm gonna walk through the visualization of a supply chain of, of natural gas from extraction, transportation, um, to gas plants, and even through waste. So the first step, extraction, which is done through hydraulic fracturing, fracking. There's a whole host of environmental problems that come with it. Uh, earthquakes, water pollution, methane emissions, which you can see here in my, in my screen. Um, and here you can see um, visually with your own two eyes what this greenhouse gas emissions look like. So um, even if you don't see a steam stack uh, the way you see it with coal, this is still what happens on the ground in the oil field. There is emissions of oil and gas. Step two, transportation. From the oil field, um, the horrors of fracking don't stop there. This oil and gas is, is transported through pipelines um, that harm communities in, in the crosshairs, harm their water. Uh, sometimes um, they go through sacred sites of indigenous communities. Um, and they also emit methane. Here you see a, what's called a blowdown. This is a very common practice in industry um, where gas is coming through the pipeline. Um, industry needs to um, do maintenance or fix something downstream of, of the pipe, pipeline. So all of the gas that is being transported through that uh, path needs to be vented into the atmosphere. And this is an example of that. We caught this um, emission event um, September of last year, and it lasted 40 minutes. So it was 40 minutes of uninterrupted, uh, unmitigated methane emissions. And this is at, coincidentally the exact same pipeline that connects the Permian to El Paso, right? So transportation, also a nightmare, also not clean. Step three of natural gas that is not clean is gas plants. A generator uh, which receives natural gas that has been fracked converts electricity, converts it into electricity, right? In El Paso, there are three main fracked gas plants, um, the ones that I mentioned previously that affect vulnerable communities like Chaparral, Montana Vista, and uh, Sunland Park. Um, you can see here with uh, optical gas imaging visualization that, again, this is not a clean process. It emits methane, it emits greenhouse gases. Uh, and then fourth step is toxic water. So fracking, it's called hydraulic fracturing because they use water and drilling fluids to break up formations underground to extract the oil and gas. Uh, the process uses billions of, of gallons of water. Um, and what happens is all of those billions of gallons of water that are being pumped into the ground with toxic drilling fluids, it is essentially taken out of the hydraulic um, cycle. So they essentially become wastewater that is very difficult, if not impossible, 
to recuperate into the water cycle. And so in the Permian Basin alone, um, about four to seven barrels of liquid wastewater are produced for every single barrel of oil. And if we go back to the first slide and remember that every day there's about um, five million barrels of oil produced, do the math, there is so much water just being completely wasted. Uh, this is an issue of environmental injustice as well because um, so many people and so many communities are being um, are facing challenges of water depletion and a lack of water resources. And instead of using these resources the way that are intended to in a sustainable way, uh, we're wasting it. Um, so last thing I wanna talk about when it comes to electricity being political is that utilities are not neutral actors. Uh, we see this in El Paso perfectly. So um, our utility, the one that I mentioned that just has 3% renewable energy is a private corporation uh, that holds a monopoly over El Paso customers. So there is virtually no democratic process in how the public utility is run. This is different from uh, my understanding of Austin Energy, for example, which is run by government agencies. And there is at least some sort of um, democratic process or buy-in from the public. Well, in El Paso, it's a private utility and it's a monopoly. So why is this important? Um, banks, uh, especially one op, um, and, and what are called private equity funds, pay attention to this. And uh, last year, um, JP Morgan Chase decided to buy out El Paso Electric. Um, why, are, why is a bank interested in a utility? Well, JP Morgan Chase is one of the largest financiers of the climate crisis. They invest billions of dollars in, in oil and gas extraction, including in the Permian. Here you can see one example of them, one example of these uh, companies, Diamondback Energy. So they invest, this bank invests in extraction. Well, it only makes sense for them also to invest in the company that receives this gas. So they're profiting both from extraction and um, usage of this gas to turn into electricity. Again, this is an example of how in, when we talk about utilities, there are decisions that are being made at that level that directly affect communities and directly affect the climate. So um, it's always important for us to understand that these are not neutral actors. There are profit motives sometimes. Uh, El Paso Electric is a perfect example. And it's a place where democracy needs to happen. Um, third part that I'm gonna talk, touch briefly on is something that Jaime mentioned at the beginning of this call, which is the state government's inability to um, halt and regulate oil and gas. But it's a little worse than deciding not to touch oil and gas. They actually promote oil and gas in a lot of ways. And I'm going to touch on some of these topics really quickly. Um, so this is one of the best statistics that I like to share about uh, the, the Texas Commission on Environmental Quality, an, an agency that is supposed to regulate and take care of our air. Uh, so 90% of the viola violations issued by this commission to oil and gas sites and oil and gas projects that um, do not follow regulations, 95% of them uh, do not result in fines or punishment because they can use loopholes, such as what's called affirmative defense. Um, they're just not being punished. And this only helps operators to um, continue to violate their regulations for profit. Another startling statistic is that 84% um, of flares in Texas are not registered, monitored, or regulated by the Texas Railroad Commission, which is another environmental agency. 
So every piece of data that they have on flaring is wildly inaccurate because they're not holding into account around 84% of these flares. Flares are uh, what you can see here in, in my zoom um, image. When there's an oil and gas site, um, there are flares that are used to, they're meant to be for emergency purposes only, but they're routinely used um, for the purposes of facilitating the pace and rapid expansion of oil and gas. So another really, really key um, highlight is the 2015 ban on banning fracking by the Texas legislature. So it's not only environmental agencies, but the legislature itself takes proactive measures to prevent communities from um, regulating themselves, from imposing regulations that prevent harm, like a, a ban on fracking in 2015. A latest example is uh, this year, the Texas legislature passed a gas discrimination bill, uh, HB 17, uh, SB 13, that made it illegal for utilities to discriminate against gas when it comes to their regulations. This is a very dangerous piece of legislation whose consequences have not been um, felt entirely yet, but it essentially gives the state government a legal hook for which uh, to attack local municipal governments climate policies. Um, and I'm adding here a very important slide for architects and designers and uh, those who work in, in infrastructure, which is uh, gas discrimination propaganda. There is um, a lot of gas companies that use cooking and cooking with oil, with, with uh, natural gas stoves as a way to justify their production and profits of gas. Um, fourthly, I want to cover this really quickly and, and transition to questions. But when, when it comes to fighting oil and gas, when it comes to uh, fighting this pollution, it is very important for us to center youth and frontline leadership because if you are um, a front, a frontline person directly affected by, say, a gas plant, you can speak very clearly and unequivocally about false climate solutions like natural gas, which was billed to the public as a transition fuel to renewable energy. Well, if you involve frontline community members into your fights, into your campaigns, they can clearly speak on how they are sacrifice zones. So um, the communities in El Paso that I mentioned that are directly affected by gas plants, they have been chosen by these companies uh, to be the sacrifice zones for their profits and energy production. Um, last week, I was uh, participated in this action in, in DC, the People versus Fossil Fuels action. Thousands of us marched in DC to urge Biden to use his authority to address the climate. Over um, 655 protesters were arrested in civil disobedience. And a huge part of this um, campaign was, and this action was centering the perspectives of frontline voices from Texas to Louisiana to Pennsylvania, New Mexico, and many indigenous communities. Uh, and here in El Paso, this is, this is here you see um, the, uh, some community members in Chaparral that they're standing right now in their home. So what you see in the background is uh, a gas plant that emits billions of um, carbon dioxide every, every day, every year. And they are facing these emissions and this pollution on a daily basis. Um, so it was really important that they lead fights uh, against El Paso Electric's new projects for gas plants. Uh, another thing I want to end on is youth. So um, it is there is a moral authority in the voice of youth activists who have to face the horrors of the climate crisis, not only right now, but when it will really take 
drastic and terrifying effect in 10, 20, 30 years. For, generation, for a generation like mine, uh, we are not sure what the future is going to look like. We're scared of what the future is going to look like. So it's very important that this moral authority um, be involved in campaigns. I added here uh, what sun, some Sunrise organizers are doing in DC. They are uh, engaged in a hunger strike. Uh, they, five of them, they're on day eight right now uh, to pressure Biden to take action and to pressure uh, Joe Manchin to stop being obstructionist to actually pass legislation that helps the climate. And same dynamics are happening in El Paso. There are youth voices that have fought the, the JP Morgan's attempts to buy out El Paso Electric that have fought back against the gas plants and that are pushing for um, more democracy and their utility. Um, so yeah, that's the conclusion to my presentation. Um, but again, these dynamics that I'm talking about, you can see them play out in different parts of the country and in New Mexico, uh, where there's a huge sale. Um, Pennsylvania, there's a lot of production there. And in countries in the global south, in Latin America, in Asia, in Africa, this is happening. Uh, so thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Miguel. Um, so we're going to wait to the end for questions. And I am going to go ahead and start introducing our next speaker, Dave Cortez. He is a uh, third generation El Paso and once again, also from El Paso. He is now based in Austin. He is here with his partner and uh, about three year old daughter. We apologize for interrupting her dinner time uh, that I think we did. And he has been involved in about 16 years of experience where he's really observed, you know, the intersection of uh, multiple environmental justice issues of like pollution, poverty, gentrification, racism. And uh, he's got a number of uh, significant accomplishments. He's worked to stop, uh, you know, copper smelters in the Rio Grande Valley, in the Rio Grande area. Uh, he helped retire fossil fuel plants here in Austin and shut down uh, a coal mine in Eagle Pass. And all of this, I think, has made him, you know, especially qualified to be the recent, the newest director of the Sierra Club. And so, from here on, it's all yours, Dave. Orle. thanks, Jaime, and thanks, Miguel. I love listening to your talk. I want to, I want to just hear it all for a longer period of time, break out and huddle together, uh, and you know, be on that protest line with you. But times change. You know, sometimes we start families, sometimes other things happen. Uh, and, you know, so it goes. And I'm just want to say to you all, you know, the next generation of activists and organizers, you all are, are that. Um, but so are the folks younger than you, your, your siblings that are younger. Uh, but honestly, so is my daughter, who's three and a half. And so when we talk about youth, and we think about the future, you know, let's reclaim that as you know ours as part of our families part of our communities it's not just this esoteric thing about a grandparent talking about their grandkids I and mean, this is our livelihoods at stake that's why we do what we do um before i share my my slides I just you can look at that my my avatar my uh, picture on my other uh, login here that's the asarco smokestack uh if you grew up in El Paso, you grew up in a sacrifice zone. You grew up in a frontline community uh, to differing degrees, different class uh, variables, different uh, privileges, uh, determine different things for different people in different parts of town. But that was an 828 uh, foot tall smokestack that you could see from every part of town. Um, and the way El Paso is situated geographically, it's at the base of the Rocky Mountains in the United States uh, and the Sierra Madre uh, in Mexico. And right at the base is the Rio Grande River. So you have this, this bolson. And any time like, uh, well, it's windy here today in Austin, but uh, say tomorrow when the temperature drops and it's nice and cold and all that, we get these things called inversions and the air just sinks and all that pollution there stays trapped. 
and you know I go to school uh, two miles from that thing go play basketball hang out in the morning before class starts you get stuff on your hands no big deal it's just like chalk whatever your nose bleeds whatever that's just kind of the thing that happens here but I didn't grow up like living in dirt you know my family was 80s middle class is what I call it which today is working class unfortunately um and never thought twice about getting my nose cauterized three times uh you know metal rods shoved up there because they couldn't figure out why i kept bleeding it wasn't until i went to school in austin learned uh same school that Miguel went to st edwards learned about uh some of these issues and how they happen uh some of the chemistry some of the science some of the politics some of the policy and then having the chance to go back home and actually seeing kids who'd been bleeding daily in Colonia Felipe Angeles on the other side of that river. Um, you know, mothers just distraught because they didn't know what was wrong with their kids. Uh, mothers with kids with MS uh, and other diseases. Why is this happening to us? It's because of that thing right there. And, you know, that, that lives and breathes in, in our people. There's all sorts of intergenerational trauma related to that. Our community was starved jobs because of that place. Uh, the only pathway out for many people was to work for that place, Asarco, um, and they harmed a lot of people. And so if you ever want to look up some examples, environmental justice in Texas, you can look up the story of Asarco in El Paso. So that being said, screen coming up. And let me, uh, I knew I wouldn't get this perfectly. That was the other thing, Miguel, you're very smooth with your presentation. I appreciated that a lot. So, excuse the slow internet connection. So when you hear me talk a lot about the work that I'm involved in, the work that we're doing at Sierra Club in Texas, it's about building power, building power to win. Uh, you know, yes, I'm, I recently hired as the new director for the Texas chapter of Sierra Club, but I've been working in the movement for 16 years, working for Sierra Club for 10. Uh, and there's a little bit about myself. I'm gonna kind of blast through some of these things because I think you heard a lot from Miguel. Uh, and I want to get to some of the application of what to do about uh, environmental racism and environmental justice. Uh, but I have to, every time, every step we take, we should acknowledge the original peoples of the land that uh, we're resting on, that we're speaking on, that we're organizing on. Uh, you can see many of the Native peoples of Texas in this land acknowledgement, the Caddo, Comanche, Kiowa, Wichita, Chickasaw, the Waco, the Tonkwa, Lipan, Apache, the Texas Band of Yaqui, the Kwawitakan, Borado, the Carrizo, Comacrudo, and you know, even Native peoples that were relocated in Texas, the Alabama Cachada, the Kickapoo, and the Tiguas back home in Isleta. We have to acknowledge that uh, no matter how many generations back we go, or our families say we go, in Texas as native Texans, as a lot of folks like to call themselves, uh, there were people here before us. And, and the people here before us uh, led a different life in relationship with the land. Uh, one that was symbiotic, uh, that was the spirit of ecology. And we've moved drastically away from that. So I'll leave that there. And you can always reach out to us at Sierra Club Lone Star Chapter about ways to get involved with undoing racism, undoing white supremacy, and continuing political education around these issues. Um, you heard it, Texas is a sacrifice zone. Uh, you're looking there at the 2011 Bastrop wildfires, worst wildfire in the history of the state of Texas. Um, that bottom right picture is uh, some of the tank farm uh, fires that happen in the Houston Ship Channel. You've got the floods from 2013, 2015, years in between in central Texas, these rain bomb 500 year floods that just ha started happening every year. And of course, last year's winter storm. Um, you all know what the fossil fuel industry is, you know what they do. Uh, and you, you heard from Miguel about the types of things that they produce. Um, some of this is from Derek at Little Sis. I uh, just wanna give a shout out for putting these things together. You'll get a copy of the slides. Uh, some of the supply chain, again, you just heard about some of this. It's important to think when uh, you look at those pic pictures of maps from Miguel's presentation that every community along that chain is impacted by 
the oil, gas, and petrochemical industry. So a lot of that gas they talk about capturing and, uh, from flaring in West Texas, you know, um, they're building petrochemical plastics production facilities along the Texas coastline to make feedstock to build all sorts of plastic crap, honestly. Uh, things that we don't need, sell it abroad. It's, uh, it's not like it's being used to make the United States energy independent or anything like that. Uh, and so I want to talk a little bit about those communities. And you heard from Miguel from the West Texas side and in New Mexico side of things. It, you know, if you're, if you're from Houston, you know, shout out in the chat. Uh, but you know, you've seen, you know what the ship channel is. Um, you know, from New Orleans to let's just call it Texas City in Houston in between you have just a, a cancer alley. Cancer alley is technically in Louisiana, but you just have this whole row of industrial facilities. And you'd never think that people lived in those areas, but they do, millions of people do. Uh, and they're the folks that Miguel was talking about. They're predominantly working class. Many of them work for, for these facilities. Many of them are of color. Um, and all you have to do is go talk to any folks in communities about cancer and their families from breathing the air or whatever their experience has been. And they've all experienced it. Um, the uh, ITC fires uh, that happened in the Houston area the last couple of years, uh, other petrochemical fires, but also when these climate disasters strike the coast, all of those facilities that I just described now have a you know carte blanche permission from the Texas Commission on Environmental Quality and the state government of Texas to go ahead and flare without any regulation at all. So Hurricane Harvey, Ida, you name it, whatever is coming, all these facilities light up like a bunch of, you know, old dudes smoking cigarettes and cigars. It is boom, flared up, smoke released uh, out in all of these frontline communities that are in the path of these storms. And they continue flaring unabated uh, until their operation deems that they don't need to do it anymore. Uh, I, I can't emphasize this enough. There's no regulation on how much they can flare in response to uh, an emergency, a storm emergency. We can dive more deep into that another time, but who's affected by this most? It's, you know, these aren't, these are real people, kids, working class people, people of color. That's my colleague's uh, son there with the respirator on his face. He's two years old, born in South Dallas, suffering from asthma since that age, hospitalized many times, South Dallas, okay? South Dallas is not the Houston ship channel. There's no reason that folks there should be forced to breathe bad air uh, in the numbers they do. But when you factor in coal plant pollution, when you factor in these highways that are built, when you factor in cement production for all of those highways and for all these developments, this is what you get. You get high concentrations of PM 2.5, PM 10, other particulates uh, that get in the airways and breathways of folks so much, so much so that they start to describe it all as just allergies, like we were talking about at the top of the hour today. Um, like when I was a kid, it's just part of how you live. You don't know anything different. And we have an, an obligation to make sure that we seek these stories out and talk to people about them and explain that it's actually someone else that's harming their, their families. Uh, I imagine you all were here last February. Uh, it was a harrowing few days. I'm still not over it. I'm still pissed. You should be too, because uh, companies like Energy Transfer Partners, who built uh, the Dakota Access Pipeline, built the Trans-Pecos Pipeline in my ancestral homelands in West Texas, um, they made tons of money when all of us were struggling to survive when our communities were struggling to survive. And they gloated about it. They had fun. People died all over the state, but predominantly in the Houston area from carbon monoxide poisoning, uh, from hypothermia. Uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's tragic, everything that happened. I, I, that's not even the right word for it. You know, it's infuriating what happened. And when you look at, I didn't, I didn't add the money trail slides in here. Derek had some. 
when you look at the state legislative session and what was done about this, and then you look as soon as the legislation, the legislative session was over and you look at campaign contributions to the governor, to key committee chairman, uh, like Senator Schwartner, uh, who's just north of Austin, or Senator Kelly Hancock, or uh, Representative Joe Deshotel, who carried that gas bill that you heard about that bans us from being able to keep uh, gas out of new home construction. All those folks got tons of money. And the top contributor was Kelsey Warren from Energy Transfer Partners. Um, we have no control over our democracy when it comes to regulating climate change, air pollution, uh, or environmental harm. And so it's important that when we look at this, we don't approach it from a single point. Uh, we have to acknowledge that there are existing, pre-existing layers of systemic oppression. This is an example of the Rio Grande Valley getting hit by a tropical storm. If any of you all know that community, know that part of, of Texas, COVID ravaged them. Poverty historically ravages them. There's not lights, there's not paved roads in many colonias, and there's definitely not stormwater infrastructure. Um, and you see the, the concentration camps that were built and continue to be used. Uh, so when these storms hit, folks have to deal with all of those things and just try and find a way to survive. Many times they're fearing uh, La Migra, they're fearing uh, Border Patrol, uh, because if they go beyond a certain point, they're going to go through checkpoints and they can't flee these storms, so they're trapped in their own communities to survive when the flooding hits. Um, on the, on, on the, down on the point of the coast, Brownsville, down to Boca Chica, those are the sacred sites in the ancestral homelands of the Carrizo Coma Crudo. This is Chairman, Tribal Chairman Juan Mancias pictured here. Uh, for the last several years, folks have been fighting to protect this unindustrialized coastline from being turned into a petrochemical and fossil fuel export zone for fracked gas exports called LNG. And now from soon to be trillionaire world's, you know, Lex Luthor himself, uh, uh, Elon Musk, uh, who has taken over a public beach in community in Boca Chica, uh, decided to build their facilities. Uh, there are explosions, many, many explosions, uh, over endangered wildlife habitat. Uh, again, people lived in, the, in Boca Chica, Boca Chica Village, which Musk wants to uh, rename Starbase as, a, as it's his own little pet city. And the important piece here around environmental justice and colonization is that we have folks who come in and see people as expendable. That's what a sacrifice zone is. You don't have climate change. You don't have environmental racism and environmental justice problems without that factor, colonization and white supremacy. Those are both built on people being expendable. And they came and looked at South Texas and said, there's nothing here, let's build it, let's go. And so I'll put in the chat in a little bit, uh, an opportunity for you all to actually submit a comment and learn more about the uh, Federal Aviation Administration's public comment period on SpaceX. And we have organizers working in Brownsville uh, to fight it, to protect the beach. Uh, to protect the, the people of the community and also to fight the LNG export facilities. So I'll get those in there. Um, briefly, again, we cannot look at one single issue when we're trying to cultivate change. There are so many layers of issues affecting a community that we might identify as, as a frontline or environmental justice community and it's important that we take time to unpack it. Apologize for going through this so quickly. I mean, we could do a whole course on these things. Uh, I encourage you all to look at uh, the background of Ella Baker, uh, not just a civil rights organizer, but the, the Ella Baker Center for Human Rights in Oakland and the organizing that they do there, which does a lot of the things that I've been talking about. I'm gonna isolate something for you to consider as you do your work, whether it's green building design, architecture, urbanism, or, or you name it. Um, when we're approaching resolving and confronting environmental justice and environmental racism, we have a few pathways we can take. Everyday politics is folks, you know, just uh, signing a petition, voting, uh, maybe putting a yard sign, you know, no way on Prop A, by the way, get out and vote, please, if you haven't voted already. Um, the second layer, you know, we're talking about policies. Okay, we're gonna 
we're going to mandate that Austin gets X number of megawatts of solar power over the next 10 years. Great, good stuff. But, you know, what about the deeper issues, structural power? Who's actually participating in the process? When we do that work to get out and vote, get people to adopt a policy, how are we making sure that the people most affected by that policy, as Miguel mentioned earlier, are being able to make decisions for themselves, speak for their own communities, and have uh, an audience that's actually going to listen to them? It's important that in our advocacy that we're doing everything we can to find those folks, listen to them, and give them opportunity to participate in the democratic process. And as we do these things, when we get into epistemic power, we're talking about a culture shift. We're talking about undoing racism. We're talking about uh, being against white supremacy culture. We're finding ways to bring communities across lines of race and class together to advocate for the common good. So there's research and reading you can do around this. I'm looking at the clock. I know we're getting kind of tight. Uh, I would love to hear from you all at some point, either in the chat or in the future. You know, what are you doing along these lines to around those four level, layers of power uh, to engage people in working class neighborhoods who maybe aren't part of uh, the green building, green design, urbanism uh, movements, uh, you know, reaching out to specific uh, multifamily uh, housing communities, et cetera. It's something to think about if you're doing it, please drop a note in the chat. Uh, if you wanna learn more and connect more, we can totally talk about that in the future. Uh, but one guide that you should look into, Google the Jemez principles for democratic organizing, six of them that are extremely helpful. Read them, read them again, study them, and talk to a friend about them. These will help you in that last prompt. Well, what do I do about this? How do I do that? These principles were written in the 1990s by lots of EJ elders and leaders, uh, grassroots community organizing folks who... I just, I love it. It's something we got our whole organization by. I'll just, uh, I'm gonna go ahead and stop so we can have some questions, but an example of how we've done this, uh, not just in Austin, but in other communities. That's my, my homie, uh, Greg Kassar. Um, you know, we were working to make sure that we were taking climate solution issues. So solar, shutting down a coal plant, et cetera, into communities that were not part of the process that uh, had the most to lose or gain, not just from climate change, but from some of the local solutions. For example, would we be okay with a solar farm being built in East Austin's oldest barrio, uh, Springville Airport neighborhood? Uh, and those folks that lived in the community, would, would we be okay with them not having access to that solar because it costs more? Or should we do something on a policy level to make sure that those folks not only got access to the solar, but saved money. And just by organizing from that lens, we were able to create a really rad coalition of folks that did things from getting safe routes to school for kids, cleaning up uh, illegal dumping and expanding uh, quality parks, swimming pools and rec centers for a community that unfortunately now has been targeted for gentrification so heavily that um, we don't know that they'll be able to stick around and enjoy so many of those benefits. So I'm gonna go ahead and stop. Uh, feel free to ask some questions. I'll share the slides so you all can talk more. Okay, thank you, Dave, once again. Thank you also, Miguel. And thank you for those two you know, great presentations. And initially I, I thought you know, the, the big takeaway might be, okay, we, we need to, we as architects, engineers, we need to plan for a fossil fuel free future. And I think that's probably obvious, but it, it definitely looks like we also have to really question how we do our work to, uh, as you mentioned, make real structural change so that we really um, involve everybody that's affected by the work that we do and the work that we need to do. And so since we don't have, we have about five minutes, I'm happy to, open it up to anybody else for questions rather than me keep talking. Um, yeah, I just wanna echo what Renee said. Thank you so much. These were such you know, passionate and important conversations. And I just really enjoyed hearing from both of you and looking forward to getting more engaged in this content. Um, 
I think uh, one of the things, I'll drop a link in the chat, a project that I worked on in Washington, DC, back when I lived there, uh, had a partnership between a developer of affordable housing and um, a, the city's energy utility, PEPCO. And they basically, the energy company paid for the installation of um, batteries to be connected as a backup to solar panels, which were installed on the roof. And then um, I think the solar panels were paid for like by a different grant uh, for clean energy and basically were set up to be sold back to the grid and the energy savings of that would go to the residents of the affordable housing um, apartment complex. And then in this, the batteries were there um, storing you know whatever solar energy they can store so that one like community room in the first level of the building was would be powered for three days on the battery power in case there was like a loss of power and so they had like a refrigerator in there for medications and people could charge their phone and um you know just like meet in a room that was conditioned for whatever season so it was like a really interesting kind of model of how like at a really small scale like building by building these kinds of ideas can start being put into practice and um you know, it's just kind of hopeful that there's like a some, some conversation happening in that space you know I'll, I'll say on that like uh god i almost called him chairman musk i don't know why that popped in my head um but musk uh, in Tesla are working hard, especially in Austin, to get uh, to shift some rules in a good way to expand batteries uh, for residential use, right? And so we're not just saying like we got to just fight these people and toss them away. I mean, this is the world's wealthiest guy. It'd be very powerful to have him on his side and honor these values. You know, be pressured constantly from every angle that we can throw at him uh, to serve the communities instead of you know being a modern day Columbus. And so it's important that we organize across our issues to make sure that these things are happening. You know, like we, yeah, we want batteries and we want these, these companies to pay for it. You know, we can't just rely on Joe Manchin and all these other folks to, you know, do these huge tax deals um, to hopefully trickle down to us. I mean, all we know, for all we know, Greg Abbott will do what they did in Houston and, and keep folks from actually receiving any of those funds when it came to Harvey relief. So thank you for raising that. Quick question for Miguel. Just can you tell us a little bit of how you got started with the Sunrise Movement? I mean, uh, at, we'll say like at what point were you, did you become a climate advocate? Uh, well, this was uh, 2018. Uh, what spoke to me about Sunrise at as opposed to other groups is that they um, confronted power within the Democratic Party, not only the Republicans, because the Republicans are easy to point and make fun of and laugh at and criticize. They're easy. They're, but what's more difficult is analyzing the power within the people that are supposed to be on our side, like the Democratic Party, and see how we can push them to do better. Their first, their breakthrough action was that they did, uh, they brought hundreds of uh, young people to the office of Nancy Pelosi did, and did a sit-in there. And that's what really spoke to me um, because I felt there was this sense of emergency. And secondly, what got me involved with Sunrise is their intersectionality approach that we can't just talk about the climate crisis in terms of engineering or um, technology. It's not a problem of technology. The climate crisis is a problem of power because we, the, mm -hmm. we don't have the ability to enact the future that we want. So um, I, th I think the quote from Audrey Lord on your presentation, Dave, was there's no single issue voters because we're all because there's no single single issue lives. Is that how the quote went? Yeah, yeah, you got it. So yeah, that's that's what got me in, into them. And, and um, they also have a system of decentralized 
um, organizing. So they kind of just let um, local groups pop up and do whatever needs to happen on a local level and their local context. Um, yeah, that, that's how I got, that's what spoke to me about them. Yeah, I felt that these sessions that we've been pulling together, definitely we wanted to capture, you know, diversity across the board, and that includes diversity of age, because I know, uh, I think a lot of younger advocates are way more enthusiastic than I ever was about any one thing in particular. So it's, you know, it's, it's, it's admirable. Uh, let's see. And, and angry and desperate. You can see that with the hunger strike to, uh, this week. Um, one of one of them was hospitalized and they're you know laying down they can't set up they're in wheelchairs they're taking their blood pressure um they're seriously putting their bodies on the line the way many other frontline communities continue to do because it's it really is an emergency and there's no time for business as usual and incrementalism Okay, uh, unless there's any other comment, we can begin to close it out. Any other questions? Um, we, we definitely wanna be able to get this out to more people. So, you know, we're gonna post this to, of course, to our own AIA page, uh, you know, uh, blast it on our Instagram and, uh, on, and basically any other place where we can think of uh, posting it because I, I think it definitely deserves a broader audience and, you all are great presenters and we hope to continue to, uh, to hear from you, um, both you know, from West Texas and right here in Austin. And uh, we hope to be in touch. Thanks, yeah, y'all, I gotta jump. I would love uh, if anyone's interested in trying to explore starting a, you know, a committee with the State Sierra Club on uh, you know, planning, building, building design, anything like that, mm. just reach out. Um, there's a lot of work to be done there. So all yeah, through this it. lens though. Yeah. Yes. I think right. I'll, I'll, I'll be good. good. Okay. All right. Everybody Peace. take care. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Jaime. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, y'all. That was great.